So I wanted to take a moment to thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Liz Kirchhoff and I'm an adult services librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Um, and we really appreciate you joining us for our program in partnership with Chicago Living Corridors. A couple of quick notes before we begin. Uh, please do mute your microphones and keep them muted. Um, if you have questions during the program, you can add them to the chat box and we'll save a little bit of time for those at the end. Um, so definitely add those as soon as you think of them and we will get to them. Um, and as you heard a moment ago, we are recording this presentation. Um, we put these on YouTube a week or so after uh, we actually have the program. And once that is on YouTube, I'll email all of you the links. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Carol Rice. Carol has been restoring the native habitat on her property for 35 years. She's been involved with several conservation organizations, including the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee, where she initiated the mentoring program, A Natural Garden in Your Yard in 2005. She is the current president of Chicago Living Corridors. Carol? Thank you, Liz. And uh, I wanted to also thank the Barrington Area Library for this partnership. And I also happy Thanksgiving, everybody. A little background on the Chicago Living Corridors. Uh, about 90% of the populated areas in Illinois are in private hands. Chicago Living Corridors emphasis is to capture the enormous potential of these privately owned properties in the effort to create habitat corridors. The strategy is to interest local organization whose members have native plantings on their property and encourage them to map them. These properties will be included on the organizational map and then on the area wide map. This comprehensive map is the major accomplishment of Chicago Living Corridors. Each organization will have its own color the website currently shows over 3,200 dots, and it serves to also direct interested individuals to local conservation organization and provides resource information. Chicago Living Quarters is an umbrella organization that encompasses a number of local organizations. Um, do you wanna go on to the next slide? Our founders include Citizens for Conservation, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. They are developing Habitat Corridors, a dynamic project to protect, restore, and expand native habitat. The Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee, about 35 years old, which founded a mentoring program, A Natural Garden in Your Yard, in 2005. It has worked with approximately 300 property owners since its inception. The Conservation Foundation is a nonprofit land and river protection organization founded in 1972. The Conservation Foundation developed Conservation at Home, which counts over 2,000 properties. Also included among our founding organizations are two Wild Ones chapters. West Cook Wild Ones and Northern Cane Wild Ones. Other <clears throat> member organizations have joined with the founders and you can see a list of them here. That would be the additional participating organizations. And a number of them are implementing the Conservation at Home program. The map that you saw on the slide is a static map, but if you go to the website, you can explore an interactive map and now to introduce our speaker tonight, who is uh, Steve Barton, whose presentation will focus on the wildlife in his backyard, attracted after 25 years of clearing buckthorn and other invasive species and planting native plants. Using photography and trail cam videos, he will show 70 species of mammals, insects, reptiles, amphibians, and birds from his yard. A majority of the species are not birds. His message is focused on the benefits of restoration and encouraging others to improve the habitat in their own yards to achieve similar results. Steve Barton is a veterinarian, herpetologist, award-winning wildlife photographer, and experienced presenter at national veterinary conferences and veterinary schools. He and his wife, Patty, have been Barrington residents for most of their adult lives. 
Steve generously donates his photography in support of Citizens for Conservation and other nonprofits across the US for use in publications, social media, and fundraising auctions. His talk will highlight his photography <clears throat> and show the benefits of habitat restoration at a local level. And Steve, I hope I haven't missed anything important, but please fill us in if there's anything you'd like to add. Take it away, Steve, and thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. And you, you didn't miss anything important because people don't wanna know about me, they wanna see the animals. So yes, I'm a veterinarian, I'm a herpetologist, I'm a wildlife photographer, and for me, it is all about the animals. Um, I'm not here to talk about habitat restoration techniques or uh, how to choose native plants or what native plants will work in your yard. Uh, I'm here to talk about the animals. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some 70 species of animals. Um, it's all photos. I think I have two word slides in, in the whole deck. Um, it's all animals, it's all photos, it's all videos. So if you like animals, you're in the right place. I think you'll be amazed how many different species there are. I think everyone's gonna learn something. Uh, I think some of you are gonna see animals that you didn't know uh, existed. I think some of you are going to see animals you didn't know are in Northeastern Illinois. And I think some of you are gonna learn a little something about some of the animals we're gonna talk about tonight. So um, I'm proud of my photography. All the photos in this talk were taken by me. All the videos um, are from my trail cams. They're all done in my yard, except for the beaver videos. Um, if you'd like to see more of my wildlife photography, my website is stevebarton.com. Uh, and I hope you'll follow me on Instagram at Stephen underscore Barton. That's Stephen with a PH, Barton with an EN. So how did this talk all start? Um, I'm posting my wildlife uh, photos from my backyard on social media almost every day. And I'm always getting comments like this. What are you, Dr. Doolittle or something? How do you get all this wildlife? And part of it is that I have been restoring uh, my, my property for oh, 28 years. Uh, but part of it is I'm looking for the wildlife. So in my office upstairs, it looks out over the backyard in the woods behind the house. Um, I've got my camera set next to the computer. So when I'm working, if I see any action or motion, I can grab my camera and start taking pictures right through the window. Our easy chairs in the living room are facing out uh, to look out the windows, not in. And so um, as we're working, as we're reading, if we see anything, you know, I'm able to grab my camera and snap some photos and we appreciate it. The game changer was getting a trail cam. And um, I chose a Browning. There are a lot of good ones out there. And the reason I chose this one is one of the reviews said, uh, the person wanted to get a trail cam to find out what was stealing his vegetables from his vegetable garden. And it turns out that it, it was his next door neighbor and her daughter. And I figured if people can't see the infrared on the trail cam, it's not going to bother the animals too much. And so that would be a good choice for me. Well, it turns out coyotes can see the infrared and they absolutely react when it comes on. It's motion triggered. Uh, and so it comes on. The coyotes usually startle and run the other way. What's interesting is the deer are very curious of the trail cam. You know, there's something new on the trail that they go down every day. And so they often come right over and sniff it and sometimes even knock it down, but they're not bothered by it at all. So this is what I'm gonna show you tonight. Um, we're gonna to start with, uh, I'm just gonna briefly describe the habitat uh, restoration we've done in our yard. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about the mammals. Uh, the insects, the reptiles and amphibians, and the birds. So I'm going to start strong and I'm going to finish strong with the things that people like most. So we live in one of the villages that make up Barrington, which is one of these um, suburbs about 35 miles northwest of Chicago. And we have a little lake in our community up here in the right. Um, our side, the west side of the lake, we have one main road that goes by, and there are just um, three ways to get in up here and it's not a through street. So that means uh, only residents drive through the neighborhood. There's very low traffic. Uh, people don't go through to get anywhere else. And we have this one big wooded block and our property is this Southwest corner where we have woods behind our house. We have woods on each side and a little bit of woods in front. We do have a little bit of lawn in front, a little bit of lawn in back. We do have a swimming pool that some of the wildlife interacts with, uh, but we're blessed with woods around us. What's interesting is I found this aerial photograph that was taken in 1939. And you can see our neighborhood lake 
It was created by a dam down here. You can see our wooded uh, block that has original woods that were never logged. And then you can see there's an open pond. Here's our property right here. That woods behind us at, in 1939 was an open pond. And since then, it's filled in with silt uh, and trees have grown up in it. Uh, so it's low, it's boggy, uh, it's owned by the village and no one will ever build a house there. So we have a little over two acres, but we have some a little bit of woods behind our house as well. And when we moved in, it was a solid wall of buckthorn and we didn't really know what to do. And everything we learned, we learned through Citizens for Conservation. So this is a, a group of volunteers in the Barrington area. They're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. Uh, they've acquired almost 500 acres of open land in the Barrington area, and they've restored it by removing invasive plants and planting native plants. Um, and the way that you learn about habitat restoration is you work with people who are doing it. And because it's all volunteer, they do have work days. It's only um, nine until 11 in the morning on Thursdays and Saturdays, and uh, it ends. So it's not an overwhelming long thing. You might be clearing buckthorn, you might be planting sedges, you might be collecting seeds, you might be cleaning seeds, you might be um, sowing seeds, uh, but you're working with people who understand the plants and the habitat and you're learning from them every time you're out there. They also have native plant sales, which is a great place to get native plants for uh, your uh, particular yard. So you can follow them on Facebook, you can follow them on Instagram. When we moved in, the woods around our house were a solid wall of buckthorn. Um, you couldn't even walk through it. You could find a deer path and scrunch down and work your way through. It was so thick that the previous owner had actually cut a path into the woods and about 50 feet in, they made a clearing and put a chair in there for a meditation spot. And you could sit in that chair and look back at the house and not see it because the buckthorn was so thick. So we've been clearing it, um, obviously with the help of my family, um, my lovely wife, Patty, and my kids when they were still at home. And um, we'd remove the buckthorn, um, then garlic mustard grew in, we removed that. Here you can see the edge of our property where it's still all buckthorn. Here you can see where it's all open and clear. And we uncovered a surprising number of little things like apple trees and little um, oak and hickory saplings. There used to be a lot of ash trees in here, but with the invasive emerald ash borer coming through, those are all dead now. We've made uh, four permanent brush piles and we consciously leave them there as habitat for the wildlife. We still collect the branches that come down and it's an amazing number of branches that come down. In that low swampy area, the uh, box elders that grew up kind of weedy trees, they tend to fall over a lot. Uh, so we do burn, we're allowed to burn in the spring and the fall, but we keep four brush piles just for habitat. And the wildlife uses it. So here's a trail cam video of a possum coming out from one of those brush piles. I knew it was there because I saw his footprints in the snow and set my trail cam up to catch him when he came out. Uh, here's the woods all cleared and open on one side of the house. Uh, you see that the deer make paths through the woods. And so that allows me to know where to set up my trail cam. Um, I also keep piles of logs. Uh, some of the dead trees, if they're too close to the house and might endanger the house if they were to fall, we'll cut those down. But typically we consciously leave the dead trees up as habitat for woodpeckers that are uh, make nest cavities and uh, squirrels and things like that. In uncovering all the buckthorn, we found a few remnants of native plants that were pretty spectacular. There was this patch of pen sedge, and we've collected the seeds and moved them around. We found two little patches of May apples, and we spread them around. Now we have multiple patches throughout the property. There were some bluebells, and now we have more. There were a few um, Dutchman's britches and trillium. Boy, the deer like those. Uh, if we don't have a screen over those, they're not going to make it. There are a few uh, blood roots and those have propagated very nicely uh, and spread around. They're the earliest bloomers, a little bit of toothwort, and we find some morel mushrooms near the apple trees uh, every once in a while in the spring. There's a low area in front of the house uh, that becomes a vernal pool. It fills up with snow melt uh, in the spring uh, and then the toads and the frogs will like to breed in there and the wildlife will like to drink in it. The deer will like to play in it but it will dry up by mid-August. And so I did, I wanted a water feature for the wildlife. So I put in a plastic pond. It's about five feet long by two and a half feet wide. It's about two and a half feet deep. I just dug a hole and put it in. I didn't bother with any uh, filters or electricity because all that requires maintenance. You have to winterize the filters and things like that. Um, initially it was pretty barren around it. I planted sedges around it. 
Initially, I put some non-native water hyacinth in there. I don't do that anymore. Uh, I'll go down to a, a vernal pond at the end of the block and get a bucket of duckweed and native plants and put it in every spring. It does fill up with leaves and get stagnant uh, over the winter. So in the spring, I just bail it out with a bucket and fill it up with a hose and it's good to go. I put some driftwood in there so the frogs have a way to get out. So over time, oh, uh, mosquito dunks. You don't want mosquitoes breeding. Uh, mosquito dunks you can buy in any hardware store. Um, it's a biologic that targets mosquito larvae, but doesn't harm frogs or tadpoles or fish. Um, I have a friend who's a biologist in Southern Illinois who has a frog pond and specifically raises frogs and tadpoles. He uses mosquito dunks and uh, says the frogs do just fine and I've had no problems. So you can see how the sedges have grown up around the pond. The wildlife comes and drinks from it on a regular basis. And it's fun to look out the window and see them using it. The raccoons like to come and play in it. Of course, raccoons are kind of hardwired to uh, look for crayfish and frogs when they find water. They feel around with their little front paws. Of course, there are no crayfish in there. We do get frogs in there, but the frogs can dive deep enough that the raccoons can't reach them. We have bird bass uh, to attract birds and have a water source for them. Uh, all the birds use it, even the big birds like the Cooper's hawk here. Uh, I saw him fly down a great big flutter of movement while I was working on my computer and took this picture through the upstairs window. Um, it's important to clean the bird bass out regularly. You'll get algae in there, but the birds poop in there a lot. And um, we like to scrub it out with a brush and fill it up with a hose once or twice a week. A game changer for us was we got a heated bird bath. We found it, I think, at Farm and Fleet or something like that. It wasn't that expensive. Um, you plug it in and it stays just warm enough that the water won't freeze in the wintertime. So um, here's on the left is a, a yellow rumped warbler. We had a pair of those that overwintered with us last winter. Uh, normally they fly south, but this one stayed all winter long. And one of those Arctic blasts when it was nine below zero, uh, the water wasn't frozen. He came and got a drink. Then the Cardinal came, we had a blizzard with nine inches of snow. And of course the uh, birdbath melted the snow um, just like it does the ice. And uh, he came and got a drink. When I posted these pictures originally, somebody warned me that, uh, oh boy, this is a big danger. The birds are dumb. They're not gonna know any better. They're gonna go and take a bath and get their feathers all wet in the cold weather. And when they come out, the water's gonna freeze and they're gonna die. And there, there are a few rare reports on the internet of this happening. Um, I don't know how big of a problem it is, but we've certainly never seen anything. Um, when I go on bird hikes in the wintertime, I find little streams that are flowing and thus don't freeze. And I find little springs that are coming out of the ground with flowing water that doesn't freeze. So wild birds in the wintertime have access to um, unfrozen water. Um, I don't know how big of a problem it is, but if you're concerned about it, you could put rocks in the water and make it shallow enough where they couldn't immerse themselves, but still take a drink in between the rocks. We have bird feeders, of course, for the birds. We feed them sunflower seeds and nuts and suet. Um, they're on poles and we use the stovepipe baffles to keep the squirrels and raccoons off. Uh, the bed of the bird feeder is about five and a half or six feet off the ground, which is too high for the squirrels to jump to. And they're far enough away from trees so the squirrels can't jump across. And I would say we haven't had a squirrel or raccoon in our bird feeders for decades. Uh, it really works. So we have cleared out woods, we have wood piles, we have uh, brush piles, we have dead trees for habitat, we have native plants uh, for food for herbivores and native insects. Virtually every bird um, will eat insects at some part of their life and the native plants attract native insects. Uh, the plants you buy in garden centers don't. Uh, they really don't help for the ecosystem. So you want native plants. And once you've built all this and provided water for them, the wildlife feels pretty much at home. So this is a view from the street looking at the front of our house and uh, they feel like it's their own. So here's one busy night with my trail cam. All of these came from one night all spliced together. It started with a skunk, then the raccoon family came by. They like to use the log as a highway. Then the fawn jumped across. A couple hours later, the doe jumped back the other way. Then at two in the morning, the raccoons came back and started horsing around. And then at four in the morning, they were back again. So a lot of wildlife all night long. Now here's 24 hours, a limping coyote elsewhere in the woods, a little later in the morning, a non-limping coyote, a different one. Later that evening, the doe came by. She paused in front of the camera. This is all within 24 hours and she was followed by her fawn. That evening, a fox came by. 
Then a rabbit went by and the fox chased it. The rabbit got away. I saw him the next night. That night, a big limb on an oak tree fell, but it didn't bother the deer. The deer was back the next morning eating. All those were within 24 hours. So we'll move on and start talking about mammals. Uh, when we first moved in and with the buckthorn, we couldn't really see into the woods from the house. Every once in a while, a big buck with antlers would walk out into the yard. And man, it was special and unusual and magnificent and stunning and we loved it. But after we've cleared out the woods, we see bucks with great regularity. Um, all fall, all November, all December during the rut, they're coming through our yard. We see them almost every single day. Usually there's one great big guy, big muscular with antlers, huge antlers. Usually there's one just a little bit smaller, maybe one year younger, not quite as big. And then usually there's two or three kind of teenage bucks uh, with either spike antlers or little forked antlers. Uh, when the big bucks come, the other ones uh, give them ground uh, and let them kind of take over. When they feel comfortable, they rest. Uh, here's one waking up in a morning sunbeam. He'd slept in the yard all night long. Uh, here's one in the upper right who came and took a little siesta in the afternoon. And the one in the bottom came walking out just as it was starting to snow and he laid down in the front lawn. Uh, that's the road behind him. He's visible from the road. And he just laid there in the snow as the snow came down and started to cover him a little bit for about an hour. We get him on the trail cam. Pretty magnificent. And we see the rut in full action. The does are running away from the bucks. Uh oh, here he comes. They're getting away. And here comes the buck chasing them. We see those almost every day and sometimes different pairs, different bucks and different does all through November and December. The does are usually solitary uh, with their fawns in the spring and summer. Uh, but in the fall, they'll gather into small herds, uh, usually eight to 12 in our neighborhood. And they'll come through and they'll just mow down all the plants they can find. The footprints in the snow in our back lawn show how many come through. It looks like we're raising cattle or something. There's so many deer that come through. And you'll find lists that list uh, deer resistant native plants that you can plant and the deer won't eat them. And I'm here to tell you the deer do not read those lists and they'll eat whatever they want. And sometimes they'll eat plants off those lists. Sometimes they'll let them be, but it's really up to the deer what's gonna survive in your yard. But we kind of put up with it um, because it's kind of fun to see the deer and to see the fawns in the spring. Here's a hydrangea bush by our back shed. And this is how it looks all summer long. Uh, bare sticks sticking out because the deer have been grazing on it on an almost daily basis. Little uh, green leaves that are trying to sprout, trying to replace the ones that have been eaten. It just looks, um, moth-eaten and disheveled the whole time. And then of course the bucks make these antler rubs on saplings. They do that in the fall to show that there's a big buck in the area, uh, both as an advertisement for the does and as a warning to the other bucks uh, that they might have to contend with him if they come into his territory. So the problem is they can kill small trees. And so we've been forced to either wrap or put um, wire cages around the trunks of the little saplings, like the small oaks that we're planting um, the small hickory trees um, and things like that. Here's a quick video to show just how fast a deer can decimate your garden. Look how many leaves he eats in just a second. That, that's a plant that you just paid 10 bucks for and it's gone just like that. And obviously in a few minutes, they can wipe out a big area. And if you think your plants up high are safe, they'll rear up on their hind legs and they can eat things up to six feet off the ground. So it's the price you pay for having wildlife. We have leash laws and uh, we're not supposed to have dogs running loose in the neighborhood, uh, but some of our neighbors are less conscientious than others. And in theory, that neighbor has a electric fence, but her dogs are loose all the time. And I get videos like this and it's kind of upsetting. And of course in the spring, the fawns come and they're just adorable. And the way it works is when a fawn is born, um, it's kind of spindly and wobbly and it can't keep up with the mother as the mother forages. It can't run away from predators very well. And so the mother will park it in a safe place in the morning, in the early morning. And that fawn will lay there still all day long, relying on its white spots to help it blend in with the dappled sunlight. And it has almost no scent at all, so it won't attract predators. As long as it stays still, you'll hardly notice them. And then the mother will come back at dusk and retrieve it and, it, and walk more slowly in the dark when things are safer. 
and the, the little uh, fawn will follow the mother at night. So the problem is people find them and we see them with some regularity, not every year, but we find them in the woods, we see them in the lawn, we see them up next to the house. Uh, this is over several years to get these photos. But um, people will find a fawn like this in their yard and think it's an orphan or it's abandoned and it needs to be rescued. And they'll pick it up and they'll put it in a dog crate and they'll try and call a wildlife rehabilitator to you know, nurse it back to health and take care of it. Uh, boy, that's the wrong thing to do. It's just fine. Mom is gonna come back and get it in the evening. Please leave it alone. Uh, stay far enough back. I know you're gonna wanna go take pictures of it. These are all taken with telephoto lenses. Uh, if you get too close, you're going to scare it and it's going to you know, run and it's not going to know where to go. You don't want to stress it like that. Walk your dog on the other side of the house on a leash. Uh, come back the next morning and it's going to be gone. And here's proof. Here's mom with a little fawn only a day or two old following her, wobbling along behind her. So we love seeing the fawns in the yard because they're so cute. Sometimes they hang out with mom, mom's always nearby. Um, once they're able to walk and keep up with her, they scratch their ears, they munch on the leaves. Usually we see twins. Usually we have about three does in our yard uh, that have fawns every summer. And usually one of them has twins. Um, it's fairly common. And if one fawn is cute, two or twice as cute and they play with each other and they chase each other. And sometimes they get the zoomies and they go just tearing around in big circles uh, while the mother stands there and watches them. And even less commonly, we get triplets. Um, I read that about 18% of the time, if there's adequate food and water, a white-tailed doe will have triplets. And if one is cute, man, three are really cute. We catch them on the trail cam. We'll catch them in the evening, following along behind mom, checking things out keeping track of each other. And we see them in the daytime, same trail cam, same group of triplets. And they're curious to the camera too, sniffing and checking things out. So moving on to raccoons. Uh, raccoons are mostly nocturnal. We rarely see them during the day. This one was coming out from under the bird feeder right at dusk. More typically, we see them on the trail cam. So here's a mother with four teenager, teenagers who haven't left her company yet. These are the trash pandas. Uh, they'll raid your trash cans. If you don't have a chimney cap, they'll get down your chimney and make a nest in there. If they get it in your attic, they'll make a huge mess. Here's a big group of them that came around and they're very curious of the trail cam as well. There was something on the ground that attracted them. I'm not sure what the scent was. Trail cam. <laughs> I wanna stress, we never feed them, we never bait them, we never put food out for them. Uh, when they find stuff, they find it on their own. You don't wanna be feeding wildlife because they lose their fear of man. Uh, maybe you'll leave them alone, but the wildlife will go up to some other house expecting food and that person's dog will bother them perhaps. Trail cams are great for finding out what's uh, causing problems in your yard. We put out grape jelly and orange slices for the Baltimore Orioles in the spring. And we find the bird feeders on the ground it's probably the raccoons, but if you want to make sure, put the trail cam out and you'll find the culprit. Possums are one of my favorite animals. And a lot of people don't like them because I think in large part because of the naked tail, it reminds people of rats. And when they're frightened, they bare their teeth like this. Notice they're not snapping. They're not lunging at you. They're just showing you their open mouth. And that really makes people frightened. Uh, they do have more teeth than most mammals. They have 50 teeth. Um, they have these cute little feet with the toes that are widespread. And on the hind feet, they have um, a prehensile uh, big toe, like an ape, which lets them grip branches. And their tail is prehensile as well. And those two together make them very good climbers. The other cool thing they do with their tail is they gather leaves. Um, I have a good friend, Jerry Reynolds in North Carolina, who has trail cams. And he has possums, uh, and he has a hole that they use underground that he set up his trail cam on. And he's caught videos of them. They gather the leaves in their mouth. They push them between their uh, front legs uh, under their chest. Then they use their front legs to push them to their hind legs. They use their hind legs to push the leaves behind them. And they scoop them up. They wrap their tail around them. And then they walk on all fours with a big bundle of leaves and their curled up tail. And they enter the hole and they use those to make their nest underground. It's pretty remarkable behavior. 
It's fun to see footprints in the snow and figure out what you're looking at with the possum. They've got the front toes are spread. And here you can see the hind foot with that prehensile uh, big toe. So you know you got a possum in the neighborhood. We see them up in the trees because they are very good climbers. We see them walk along the ground on the trail cam and they have good noses. They find stuff to nibble on. And again, we never bait them. We never feed them. And they're very uh, clean. Here's one cleaning himself just like a little cat. One of the things they're famous for is eating ticks. Um, I've read that one possum can eat 5,000 ticks in a season. Uh, so I love having possums in the yard. If he eats one tick, I'm happy to have him in the yard. Um, it's probable that most of the ticks they get from grooming them off of their own fur because they are very clean. Possums also are our only North American marsupial. That means they have a pouch like a kangaroo. And the babies are born tiny and premature, the size of a bumblebee. And they make their way up into the pouch and they latch onto a teat and they nurse until they're too big to fit in the pouch anymore. And they still hang out with mom for a while. So we replaced our deck this past summer. And when the workmen got back up to that corner of the house, when they pulled off that board, there was a nest of teenage possums, too big for the mom's pouch. There were six of them. And they stopped right away. They knew we were animal lovers. Uh, they left them alone. They went around and worked on the other side of the house for the rest of the day. Uh, they told me when I got home uh, in the early afternoon, I took the picture on the right with my cell phone and uh, backed away and left them alone. And I set up my trail cam, figuring I'd catch mom when she comes to uh, uh, collect them and move them somewhere else uh, in the evening. About five o'clock, I opened the back door and stuck my head out. And here on the left, this little one was sticking his head out from under and looking around. I thought it was pretty cute. So I took the picture. And it wasn't until I blew it up on my computer screen that I realized this pink thing is mom's great big hind foot. And this gray thing is mom's great big scaly tail. And even though it was still light out, she had come back and was cuddled up with her babies. And sure enough, the next morning they were gone and the trail cam had nothing. Um, she stealthily, stealthily took them away. And I don't know quite how she managed that. And this is probably my favorite tail, trail cam video of this year. Look at the eye shine in the middle. It's just a little and it's brief because she goes behind the tree, but there's big eyes on the bottom and a bunch of little eyes on top. That's mother possum with all the little babies riding on her back and their eyes are shining in the light. So this was just a few days later and she was just moving them through the woods. So skunks, a lot of people don't like skunks either because they know that they can spray you with that horrible smell. And a lot of you have suffered of dogs who you let out at night and they come home having found a skunk in the backyard and harassed it and gotten sprayed. And boy, is that a pain to deal with. Well, one time we were having dinner and my mother-in-law was eating with us and she looked over my shoulder out the window and she said, what are all those little black and white kitties coming out from under the deck? It was a mother skunk with four babies. And I grabbed my camera. I only had got two pictures before they waddled off. Um, but we never even knew they were there. And I'm sure we've had other skunks under there um, that we don't bother them and they don't bother us. And it's a good reason to walk your dog on a leash at night. Um, then it'll never run into a skunk because you'll be able to control it. But we see them on trail cams. They're mostly nocturnal. Something agitated this one. His tail is up. He's not sure where to go. I'm not sure what it was. We see him drinking from the pond. We see him out in the wintertime. Look how fat and warm this guy is in the middle of a snowstorm. So um, one time we had a yellow jacket nest in the ground next to our garden. And one morning a skunk had dug it all up and eaten all the uh, honeycombs and destroyed the yellow jacket nest. So I'm pretty happy to have them around if they're gonna do that. If you find little holes dug up all over your yard, that's probably skunks going after grubs. You probably have a grub, grub problem. So weasels are related to skunks in the mustelid family. A lot of people don't realize how common long-tailed weasels are in the um, Chicago suburbs. So they're long and thin, they're light brown with a white chest, they have a dark tail tip. In the wintertime, they turn white. I've never actually seen one around here in the wintertime. Um, we're far enough south, they may not turn completely white, but they turn partially white uh, in the area. So one time I had a, a chipmunk a problem. They were digging under some bushes and I said, I have a hard trap uh, to relocate them uh, farther away from the house. And one night I caught a weasel uh, by accident. Um, so this was early in the morning when I checked the trap. I let him go back under the deck and told him to get to work. But we see him on the trail cam. 
look how uh, fast and agile they are. They're just frenetic. He's so fast, it's hard to see. So I slowed the video down and watch him leap across and land and go darting away, long and skinny and agile. So here's another one uh, later. Um, they're just constantly moving. Uh, they remind me of the Tasmanian devil in the Bugs Bunny cartoons. And they're ferocious predators. Uh, they eat rodents and they'll tackle a prey that's bigger than they are. A little weasel like this can take down a full grown rabbit. Closely related to the weasels and the skunks are the um, mink. So mink are more aquatic and they tend to spend more time by the lake, which is two blocks away. So we don't get them in the yard very often, but every once in a while one comes through. So the mink are a little bigger than the weasel. They're a little thicker bodied. They're certainly darker colored. Uh, they, they're uh, more dark chocolate brown and they're not so uh, frenetic in their activity, but they are voracious predators. And here's one during the daytime running down the log as well. They have kind of a loping gait. And beavers. Uh, so I don't have photos of beavers actually in my yard, uh, but there's an active beaver colony on the Citizens for Conservation property. Flint Creek runs through. They've got a dam and a big den. And I caught a video. Um, the restoration manager showed me where they were working. So I set up the uh, trail cam on this log that was like near completion and caught the video of him bringing that tree down a little bit. And then I set it up on their lodge. And in one night, if you look at the date in the lower uh, right, it was a year ago yesterday that I took these videos. Um, 120 videos in one night. And see, these are some of the better ones spliced together and speeded up. When they gather mud um, and from the creek and carry it up to their lodge, they walk on their hind legs bipedally and carry it with their front legs. And they carry tufts of grass and they carry the uh, sticks. So my one beaver story is one time in the 1990s, my son came in and told me there was a beaver in the yard chewing on the tree. And we're two blocks from the, the lake. And uh, I sprayed it with a hose to try and make it go away and it wouldn't go away. I think it probably had a little heat stroke. It was like 95 degrees that day. And um, I put a garbage can over it and slid the lid underneath and we carried him back down to the lake. And boy, when he hit the water, you could just see him go, ah, as he finally cooled off on that hot day. So we have coyotes and uh, people are very concerned about coyotes, concerned about coyotes attacking them, concerned about coyotes attacking their pets. Um, there's certainly a lot of advice online on how to deal with coyotes. You never wanna feed them because they lose their fear of man, make a lot of noise if you see one and they'll go away. Uh, they're active both during the day and at night and they certainly are a threat to your pets. Um, and so these are all photos that I took through the window in. Uh, uh, from my house in my yard. We see them with great regularity. And they're active, uh, here's one 9.30 in the morning, a, a couple of them coming through the side woods. Here's one at 4.13 in the afternoon, jumping up on the log to look around. And again, because we've taken the buckthorn out, he can see a long distance. He's looking at uh, the road, maybe cars coming down or pedestrians or someone on the other side of the street. There's one coming through at 1247 in the afternoon in a blizzard. There's one coming on the log at 554 in the morning. All right, and just a couple days later, here's the very same log, the very same trail cam, and here comes a neighbor's cat. So um, I post these coyote videos all the time, and the neighbors who follow me on Facebook and Instagram know that we have a lot of coyotes, but one of my neighbors isn't getting the message, and about every other year I get I see the cat on my trail cam videos several times over a period of about two months, and then I don't see him anymore. It's been about six weeks since I've seen this cat on the trail cam. Um, I hope that that means that either the owner is keeping the cat indoors now. I hope that it means that um, either that or they moved away. Um, but, you know, your, your cat's pretty smart and your cat will do pretty well outside, sometimes for years until the one night they don't. And if they meet a coyote, they're gonna lose. Uh, if they meet a car, they're gonna lose. It's a dangerous world out there and you really should keep your cats indoors. Plus the cats are hunting the whole time. I'm kind of annoyed that this cat is, you know, hunting mice and things in my yard. There was a study in Los Angeles uh, that looked at the DNA of coyote scat. And they concluded that 40% of the diet of coyotes in Los Angeles was made up of house cats, 40%. It's a little less in suburban areas compared to urban areas but it's dangerous out there for your cat. 
Moving on to red foxes, uh, I think these are the prettiest of all the mammals with their bright red coat and their black legs and their coat and their tails get so fluffy in the wintertime. Here's one that came uh, trying to catch a squirrel um, under our bird feeders uh, one evening while we were looking out the windows. Here's a couple more coming by the bird feeders. One of the funny things about red foxes is they have vertical pupils like a cat. A lot of people don't know that. They look at them and they think they look kind of weird. It's like when somebody in your office shaves off his mustache and you think, he looks different. What's different? And you can't, you can't quite place it. Do you lose weight? Well, it, it's the eyeballs. We think of uh, vertical pupils as being a cat thing, but it's really a small predator thing. It's a size thing. So small predators often have vertical pupils and it seems to help them pounce with more uh, precision when they pounce on their prey. Um, so dogs are bigger predators and have round eyes. Foxes have vertical pupils. But if you think about other cats like lions and tigers and jaguars, they're much bigger. They all have round pupils. So the, the pupil shape is not necessarily a strictly cat and dog thing. Here's one on the trail cam in that late afternoon sunshine that shows off his pretty red coat. And then he just saunters off through the woods uh, behind the house. Here's one on the log. Um, just in December, just about a year ago. So we all have squirrels and you know, we have gray squirrels, some of which are black and we have fox squirrels. A lot of people don't realize that Southern flag squirrels are common throughout the entire state of Illinois. Uh, they're common in the Barrington area and they like um, old forests that have dead trees because they're cavity nesters. The problem is they're nocturnal and so you rarely see flying squirrels. They're about the size of a chipmunk they have a little fold of skin between their front and hind legs. And when they leap off of a tree, they stretch their legs out like the letter X. And that straightens out the fold of skin between the front and hind legs. So it works like a parachute um, and allows them to glide from tree to tree or from tree to ground. Their little tail is flat. It works like a rudder as they're gliding and helps them steer. And they have great big black eyes because they're nocturnal, which makes them really cute. So this one was in a wren house um, and I knew it was there because you can see in the upper left how he's done that raw, uh, rodent gnawing of the wood, that particularly uh, characteristic chew mark. Uh, so I knew a rodent was in there. It's about um, almost eight feet off the ground. So I reached up and knocked on it with my knuckles with my camera ready and the little flying squirrel ran out. I snapped one picture and he ran back in the hole really fast. This is one of the coolest uh, trail cam videos I ever got. The deer set off the motion sensor on the trail cam, and then this white thing glides by. And it's clearly not a moth, and I couldn't figure out what it was until I slowed it down. It's a flying squirrel gliding by. You can see his tail in the back. And he glides by so fast that if, if it were the squirrel alone setting off the motion sensor, he'd already be out of the frame by the time the camera started. But we do get him on the log. Uh, so here's a little flying squirrel. You can see the fold of skin between his front and hind legs. He's got a hickory nut in his mouth. That vertical tree is a hickory tree that has tons of nuts. You can see his great big nocturnal eyes. You can see his flat little tail, unlike the bushy tail of a uh, gray squirrel. Here's a, another night. He jumps up on that prominence. Now watch. I slowed it down. He glides over the tree, and you can see him stretch out his arm, his um his skin between his front and hind legs. We'll watch it one more time. He jumps up and then he glides across. I think flying squirrels are the cutest mammals we have. So moving on to mice, um, we all have um, know about house mice. We know that there's a white-footed mouse, there's a deer mouse, there's a meadow vole, there's a sh uh, short-tailed shrew. Those are the typical rodents we see. Very few people know that we have a metal jumping mouse. And unfortunately, one time I found a dead mouse in the pool, it had fallen in the pool and drowned. Um, and when I fished it out, look at those hind legs. They're huge and long like a kangaroo. And he has a really long tail like a kangaroo has to balance. And he has normal short little front legs, um, very uncharacteristic proportions. And the jumping mouse jumps and leaps like almost like a kangaroo rat out west. Um, I have seen them in prairie. Uh, these other two pictures I took in some restored prairie just over the border in Wisconsin. 
Uh, several times I've seen jumping mice in that prairie where they go leaping like a kangaroo through the grass. They're really fast, they don't stop. I was really lucky to get a picture of his face. Running away, you see the characteristic color, dark brown on top and kind of golden color on the sides. A lot of people didn't know we have jumping mice. I think I got a trail cam of one here. See how long his tail is and look at him go boing, boing, boing. Now watch this, boing. So again, with that really long tail and the leaping thing, I'm pretty sure I got a video of a jumping mouse here. So moving on to insects. Um, we all know that we have pollinators. We have bumblebees and we have honeybees, uh, and they're pretty common. And they'll come to other flowers, but they really like the native flowers. And this is why you want to plant native flowers in your garden. So here's a cone flower, here's some goldenrod, here's an aster with some of the bumblebees. And there are many species of bumblebees. Here we have a honeybee coming to a uh, spiderwort in our yard. Um, here's a globe flower. So admittedly, that's not a native flower. That's one from a garden store, but boy, the pollinators like it. So we've got a honeybee, a silver spotted skipper a butterfly, and a grass carrying wasp on it all at the same time. So what I like to do is when we have the um, bees coming to the flowers, I like to look at all the dozens, even hundreds of honeybees and bumblebees and try and spot something that looks different. And if it looks different, I try to notice its characteristics and see if I can identify it. So uh, here in the upper left, we have a grass carrying wasp. It's a big wasp, about an inch and a half long. It's black with a narrow little waist. What they do is um, they carry grass, uh, dead grass to make their nest. And when we open our casement windows of our living room, which are right next to where the flowers are, Sometimes we find them packed with dead grass in the crevice between the window and the sill, uh, on the top, on the sides, on the bottom. And we find little dead green grasshoppers, like, like inch long katydids, uh, in the dead grass. So what these wasps do is they'll sting the insect and paralyze it and lay a single egg on the dead insect. Then when the egg hatches, the larvae will eat the paralyzed insect as it grows before it forms its uh, cocoon and turns into an adult wasp. Uh, interesting behavior. This smaller wasp, about the size of a honeybee, again, that's on a non-native flower, that's garlic chives, but boy, the pollinators love it. Hundreds of them come to the garlic chives, so we do allow one little patch of garlic chives to go. This black wasp has a yellow collar and a, a yellow first segment of its abdomen. It's a four-toothed mason wasp. This big golden wasp um, is an inch and a half long. It's kind of uh, orange colored with a black tip of its abdomen. It's the great golden digger wasp and they dig tunnels underground, it's another one that will paralyze insects with its sting and lay an egg on the insect uh, so that the larvae can develop eating that paralyzed insect. Another big wasp is the great black wasp. It's not quite as big as the grass carrying wasp. It's black, but it has metallic blue wings that are particularly pretty. The biggest wasp is the cicada killer. It's two inches long. It has a black and yellow abdomen. They hover um, flying over the lawn, about five feet off the ground, back and forth, back and forth patrolling. Uh, people freak out when they see them because it's a two inch wasp. They're afraid it's gonna attack them. It's not gonna attack them, it's hunting cicadas. And when it finds the cicadas, like the other wasp, it'll sting them and paralyze them. One time I could see where they were going and we had one little raised area in the garden with bricks and this wasp had dug a tunnel between the bricks this one had two uh, cicadas that had already paralyzed and was in the process of dragging one underground uh, as food for its uh, larvae. Other bees, um, the metallic green bees are sweat bees. They're only a quarter of an inch long. They're tiny little things, but they're bright metallic green. They're really pretty. And the two-spotted longhorn is about the size of a bumblebee. I'm sorry, of a honeybee, but it's kind of hairy like a bumblebee, but it's black and it has yellow legs and has really long antenna. And then finally, these um, bald-faced hornets make the big paper wasp nest. They're called bald-faced hornets. And typically their nests are 20 to 30 feet up in the trees and you don't even know they're there until the leaves come down in the fall. And then all of a sudden you spot this big paper wasp nest that's been there all summer long and the wasps never bothered you. This one, they happened to build in a flowering crab tree right next to our driveway so we could see it every time we came and left. Uh, one night we came home and a bunch of the um, wasps were on the outside of the nest. I'm not sure if something had disturbed the nest and they came out to investigate and defend it, or um, if it was just hot that night and they were coming out because it was cooler outside. 
They will defend their nest vigorously. If you disturb their nest, the entire swarm will come after you. Um, it's not pretty. But you can stand five feet away with the telephoto lens and take interesting uh, photos of them coming and going. Again, bald-faced hornet. Then some of the uh, pollinators, the, the um, moths and the butterflies, the little guys are skippers. Fiery skipper and silver spotted skipper has the white spot. Uh, one time we had luna moths on the side of the garage. There was one pair mating and a third one nearby. I think the third one was a male that was attracted to the pheromones that the female was secreting to attract mates. They have those long projections on the caudal wings that kind of flutter as they fly. Uh, they have the um, feathery like moth antennas. Uh, they're light green and they're primarily nocturnal. Uh, people wonder what the function of those long trailing caudal wings are. I saw a study that showed that it has to do with bat avoidance. So when bats are hunting moths at night, um, those projections will flutter and it confuses the bat's echolocation and makes it harder for the bat to catch the moth. So I saw a study where they put luna moths and bats in a room and they uh, counted how many times the bats could catch the moths. And then they trimmed those projections off and they found the bats were able to catch the moths, moths much more easily. So it messes up bat echolocation, kind of an interesting adaptation. We get these sphinx moths, which are sometimes called hawk moths, and they'll hover in front of flowers like a hummingbird. And they use that super long proboscis to collect nectar from the flowers. So yeah, that's a non-native petunia, but it was in a basket on the deck uh, near the pool. And this moth was hovering uh, next to it. And I grabbed my camera and took this picture through the window. Here's another kind of sphinx moth called the snowberry clear wing. It's uh, about an inch long, maybe an inch and a quarter. It's colored like a bumblebee. So it's a bumblebee mimic. So it, hopefully predators will think that it might be able to sting them and will leave it alone. But it has clear wings. Here's a picture of one hovering in front of a, a monarda flower or bee balm. And of course, the poster child for butterflies is the monarch. Monarchs are milkweed specialists, and we specifically plant milkweeds in our yard to attract the butterflies or the monarch butterflies. And they lay eggs on the milkweeds, and these uh, yellow and white and black striped caterpillars hatch out. They're pretty tiny when they first hatch. You can see that's a pencil point uh, put in the frame for size reference. And you can see how much of a hole in that leaf that caterpillar has already made. Uh, the one on the right is bigger. It's three, three and a half inches long and ready to form a chrysalis or a cocoon. And that chrysalis they make is a bright lime green. It's really pretty, but it's the exact same color as the milkweed, which means they're hard to spot. And we had three of them on one milkweed plant. I'd go out and check them every morning. And knowing exactly where they were, it still took me a minute or two to find them because they blend in so well. And they're smaller than you think. They're only about an inch long. So after two, two and a half weeks, when they're ready to hatch and the newly, where the caterpillar is turned into the butterfly and the butterfly is ready to emerge, the chrysalis will turn from green to um, clear and you're able to see the butterfly's wings right through it. So I took this picture at eight o'clock in the morning before I went to work. Um, I came home at about 1.30 and all three had already hatched during those few hours. And the monarchs were on the plants, drying their wings, getting ready to fly away. Another cool little bug is the assassin bug. These guys are only a quarter of an inch long, and you can see they have little gripper front legs like praying mantises have, and they have a long stabbing proboscis like an assassin bug. So they'll sit on the flower and wait for a pollinator to come. Um, these are on the garlic chives because that's where all the bees were that year, but they prefer goldenrod where they blend right in. And when the pollinator comes like a honeybee, much bigger than they are, they'll grab it with their front legs, they'll pierce it with their proboscis, um, they'll kill it, uh, I assume there's some kind of venom, uh, and then they'll suck the juices out using that proboscis. So the way you find them is, as you're walking through a field of goldenrod, if you notice a bee that's not moving, check it out closely. It might be a dead bee with an assassin bug that's blending in, uh, holding it. The praying mantises that we have here are not native. The native praying mantises only get as far north as the central part of the state, around Effingham or maybe even as far as Champaign. Uh, the ones around here are non-native ones and they sell praying mantis egg cases uh, in garden centers to eat uh, insect pests, uh, kind of a natural pest control system. So we have a European mantis and we have a Chinese mantis. 
Um, they're not native if you find them around here. Uh, they're interesting. Um, the European ones have this eye spot on the inside of their front legs. It's black with a white center. And when they're uh, frightened, they hold those legs out and the eye spots uh, hopefully will startle a predator. Here you see a pair of mating in the fall. These just showed up in our yard one year, probably from some neighbors. And everyone thinks that the female always eats the head of the male during mating and kills the male. So that mating for a male praying mantis is always a fatal endeavor. Uh, but in fact, that's mostly a captivity issue. In captivity, it happens a lot. In the wild, it's pretty uncommon, uh, probably 10% of the time or so, um, if that. So it's not automatic that the female always eats the head of the male during mating. The Chinese mantis lacks those eye spots and it's a little bit bigger. Um, it can be four, four and a half, pushing five inches in length. I really like spiders and I like these black and yellow garden spiders. Um, they build webs that are fairly conspicuous and they have these white uh, zigzag or zipper configuration in the web. So it makes it fairly easy to spot them in your garden. Uh, when I spot them, it makes me think my garden is doing really well, that it's a healthy garden, that we don't have too many pesticides or insecticides. The females are chunkier, the males are a little skinnier. Here's one eating a leaf hopper. Moving on to reptiles and amphibians. These are my favorite. By far the most common reptile and amphibian we have is the American toad. Um, it's a toad, not a frog. It has these little glands on its back. Um, we find them in the lawn, we find them in the pool. Um, we have little things so they can climb out and I'm checking the pool every morning. We find them in the woods. Uh, they're real common and they love that uh, vernal pond in our front yard. Uh, they'll sit around the edge and they'll mate. A lot of people don't like the noise because it's really loud at night, but we think it's quite beautiful. The other really common frog is the chorus frog. Um, it's called the boreal chorus frog. It used to be called the Western chorus frog. They're only an inch long. Uh, they're light brown with uh, longitudinal dark brown stripes. Uh, and they call from literally every roadside ditch that has water, every little tiny pond, every little uh, puddle. Um, they only need a puddle literally five feet in diameter to mate in. And they'll call from um, spring into the middle of summer. Um, so it's by far the most common frog. And if you hear frogs calling, this is probably what you're listening to. If you get too close, they stop calling. They're only an inch long and they're pretty hard to spot. But if you're patient, they'll start calling again if you hold still. We have gray tree frogs in the area. The, these are far less common. Uh, they're tree frogs with little um, toe pads. Uh, they stick on things, they climb in trees. I've seen them maybe half a dozen times in the 28 years we've lived in this house. Um, when they first transform from tadpoles into froglets, they're tiny and they're light green. When they're really young, they're light green. They can change color depending on temperature and humidity and um, probably emotions, uh, but they can be light green, they can be dark green, they can be light gray, they can be dark gray. Very often the big adults are light gray with, and then they'll develop dark gray irregular blotches on their back so that they blend in with the trunk of an oak tree very nicely. Green frogs are the most common true frogs. Um, that's its name, green frog. It's kind of a mottled dull green. Um, the males often have a light colored upper lip, but you'll see that in bullfrogs sometimes as well, which is a different species and that's not characteristic. What is characteristic is they have this dorsolateral fold in their skin. So see this fold of skin coming from their eye, coming two thirds of the way back to their hip. Here on this one, you can see the fold of skin here. That signifies that it's a green frog. Here's a bullfrog. Bullfrogs, oh, and the green frogs find that little plastic pond every summer. They're the most common true frog. Bullfrogs are less common. They like the lake better and they stay down by the lake, but they'll move around a lot during rainstorms. And so occasionally we'll see them in our pond. Occasionally I'll see them in my pool. Um, they lack that dorsolateral fold. That fold in a bullfrog wraps right around the eardrum. It does not extend on the back. So this is the eardrum, this flat thing on the back of the head. In a male, the eardrum is a much larger diameter than the eyeball. So this one is a male. In a female, the eardrum and the eyeball are the same diameter. We also get leopard frogs. Leopard frogs have leopard-like spots. They're a grassland frog. We see them on the prairies in the restored um, Citizens for Conservation habitat all the time. I see them in my lawn, but I never see them in the woods. Uh, they like grasslands better. Uh, but I do find them in my pool in the spring every once in a while. There are only a couple salamanders in our area. There's the tiger salamander and the blue spotted salamander. Boy, back in the 60s and 70s, tiger salamanders were very common in the Barrington area. 
uh, but with more and more development, more and more housing developments, uh, they've lost many of their breeding ponds and more and more use of insecticides. Um, tiger salamanders are pretty rare now. They are mole salamanders. They spend most of their time underground, so you don't run in, into them very much. They will be crossing roads in the very early spring on their way to breeding ponds. And they will walk across snow and they will enter a pond that still has ice in the middle to breed. They're one of the earliest breeders. The tiger salamanders are black with yellow spots that are irregular. They're usually about eight inches long, six to eight inches long, but they can be as long as a foot. The blue spotted salamanders are smaller. They're only about three, three and a half inches long and they have, uh, they're black with light blue spots. I found one blue spotted salamander in the pool once in 28 years. Uh, they're very uncommon in this area. I do know of a pretty good population um, in a nearby village, but not, not right in our neighborhood. Turtles, of course, are more common in the lake and that's two blocks away, but the females will wander around looking for places to lay their eggs. So um, we find uh, like painted turtles, uh, here's a female looking for a place to lay her eggs in my driveway one day when I came home from work. And we see snapping turtles walking around the neighborhood. The females come out looking for places to lay their eggs. And my neighbors are always calling me complaining. There's one in my yard, what do I do? Uh, again, like the, the fawn deers, um, just walk your dog on a leash on the other side of the house. She'll lay her eggs and she'll be gone in a few hours. You got nothing to worry about. And people freak out when they see him crossing the, the road. You know, it's a snapping turtle, it's gonna bite me. What, what am I gonna do? Well, it's a turtle. I mean, it's not like it's gonna chase you. You can walk backwards and be faster than the turtle to get away from it. Um, they will snap and defend themselves. Um, but the thing is they know where they live. They know where their territory is. Um, if you move them, um, they want to get back to their home territory. One time a neighbor found one, a neighbor who lived right on the lakefront, and it was in the water right next to um, his shoreline, and he was afraid it was gonna attack his kids and his dog, and he wanted me to move it. And I said, no, it's not bothering anyone. You know, it's not gonna bite you, it's not gonna attack you. It knows when you come around, it's gonna defend itself and, and run away. It, it doesn't want a confrontation. And um, he said, no, if you don't move it, I'm gonna kill it. So I said, fine, and I, I moved it to the other side of the lake and put it in. Uh, half a mile away, uh, maybe a mile away. In 36 hours, it was right back in the same spot. So what that means is when you find one crossing the road and you look around, you don't see any water nearby, you think, oh, it needs water. I know where a good pond is. I'll move it to a pond where it'll be much happier. But you moved away from its home territory and it's gonna try to get home and it's gonna cross other roads trying to get home and its chance of getting hit by a car are much greater. So imagine if your grandmother was crossing a street and a Boy Scout was gonna help her across. And instead of helping her across to the other side where she wanted to go and where she knew the neighborhood, he put her in the car and took her to the other side of town. Imagine how disorienting that would be. So if you find a turtle crossing the road, help it across in the direction it's heading and leave it there. To pick up a snapping turtle, never pick them up by the tail uh, because they're so heavy, you can injure their tail. Um, it's too much weight to hang from that. And of course, if you come from the, the front, they will defend themselves and snap. So if you steady the tail and if you come from behind and if you slide your hand underneath like you're holding a tray of drinks, hold the bottom of the turtle shell and use the tail to steady it so it doesn't fall off and just quickly carry it across the road and set it down. We have snakes. And if you remember one thing about tonight's talk, this is the one thing I want you to remember. There are no venomous snakes in the Barrington area. There are none, there never have been. If you think you saw a rattlesnake, if you think you saw a copperhead, you misidentified a harmless snake. What we do have are garter snakes. Garter snakes are black or dark green with long yellow stripes. They're perfectly harmless. They eat worms and, and frogs and fish. We have uh, fox snakes. Oops, oh, I went too far. There we go. Fox snakes are uh, a type of rat snake, not a type of rattlesnake, but a type of rat snake because they eat rats and mice. Uh, they're related to corn snakes that so many people keep for pets. Look at the tip of its tail down here. It's a nice sharp point. The problem is they will vibrate their tail when they're disturbed and frightened. They don't have a rattle, but they'll shake their tail. People see that shaking tail and they assume it's a rattlesnake and they kill it with a shovel. Fox snakes can get to be four feet long, one fox snake can live to be 25 to 30 years old and can eat over a thousand uh, rats and mice in its lifetime. That's a tremendous predator to control vermin. 
You don't want a thousand rats and mice in your yard. So if you see one of these, please don't kill it. Sometimes they have a palish head without any markings on it. And people see that pale head and say, oh no, it's a copperhead. We don't have any copperheads in the area either. Copperheads only get as far north as central Illinois. So if you see something and you think it's that, it's not. Here's a younger fox snake. It's a little brighter colored. And here's a milk snake. It looks kind of similar, but it's thinner. It's shinier and it's smaller. Um, it's a little brighter colored. It has more red in its pattern. Uh, milk snake is related to a king snake. They will eat other snakes. They will eat rodents. Notice too, its tail comes to a nice sharp point with no rattle and it will rattle its tail like a rattlesnake. Um, but it's not a rattlesnake. It's perfectly harmless. It's a good snake to have around. The young are much redder. Uh, see how this new hatchling has a lot of red in its pattern? And they turn more brown as they get older. And they're kind of shiny compared to the fox snake. Look how the flash is reflected off of both, both of these snakes. Uh, I use flash photography here. I have a neighbor who lives a block away from me. Her house is on a peninsula uh, that sticks out in the fen. The fen is the little uh, wetland uh, where the, uh, our lake empties out into. And it's full of native plants and the snakes love the fen, but they come out onto her property because it's high ground to hibernate. And they like to work their way into her house in her crawl space in her basement and she'll find them in her basement in the wintertime. Um, they probably, a few of them lay their eggs in her house. We know for a fact because she had her chimney redone and she found milk snake eggs inside her chimney that were all hatched out. And she finds baby snakes that might have hatched in her house and haven't found their way out um, every winter. So when she finds them in the winter, she brings them to me and I keep them in my heated garage to hibernate them until it's spring, until it's warm enough to let them go back in her yard. So this is her take from one winter. So these little guys that are red are baby milk snakes that probably hatched out in her yard. These dark guys with the longitudinal yellow stripes are darter snakes. There's four of them in here. This little spotted guy is a fox snake. This bigger one is a fox snake. And then these three on this side are three bigger milk snakes. Moving on to birds, and I know you like birds better than snakes, most of you. Um, you put out bird feeders and you attract birds, and when the migrants come through, it's really exciting. And some of them in the spring are really pretty, like the rose-breasted grosbeak. The female is duller and looks like a sparrow. Um, we put out grape jelly and oranges for the Baltimore Orioles, and we get them every spring. And then, of course, the bright blue indigo buntings. But if you have native, native plants and native habitat, you'll attract the kind of birds that don't come to the bird feeder, like the ruby crown kinglet with its little red head. These are small little guys the size of a warbler. Here's an American tree sparrow uh, with a black chest spot, and he's got a bicolored beak, dark on top and yellow underneath. Here's the fox sparrow, much bigger than other sparrows. It's mostly shades of gray and brown. And here's the white-throated sparrow. If you plant um, trees with berries, this is a service berry, which is not exactly a native plant, but boy, the birds love the berries. The cedar waxwings are berry specialists and they'll come in flocks, six or eight or 12 of them will fly into the tree and wolf down a bunch of berries and they go flying away. Uh, the robins like the berries too, the uh, uh, blue jays like them, uh, even the chipmunks and squirrels climb up and eat the berries and sometimes even raccoons try to climb the tree to get the berries. People can eat the berries too. We get bluebirds occasionally, eastern bluebirds. Um, they're really pretty. They prefer prairies. They don't like the woods like we have. But when I'm walking through the woods with my camera looking for warblers in the spring, sometimes we've got a bluebird passing through. Um, my favorite nature quote was by Henry David Thoreau. He said, the bluebird carries the sky on his back. Isn't that perfect? And of course, woodpeckers are one of my favorites. Woodpeckers really like suet. So we put suet in our bird feeders in the winter and fall. Um, the red-bellied woodpecker is the most common. Uh, the males have a lot of red on their head, the females less so. People see the red on their head and think it's a red-headed woodpecker, but that's a different species that I'll show you later. He has this pinkest blush on his belly that's kind of subtle, thus the name. Uh, these are the most common woodpeckers in our area. And here's why we leave dead trees up, because the woodpeckers will make cavities and make their nests in the dead trees. And then later other animals can use those same nest holes. I was walking through the woods and I heard chirping and I looked up and this little baby downy woodpecker stuck his head out of the hole. So I set up my camera on the tripod and mom came by every 20 minutes with a big juicy caterpillar to feed her baby. So the downy woodpecker is black and white. 
Um, the males have a little red patch on the back of their head. Um, it's smaller and it has a smaller beak. There's another downy woodpecker making another nest in a different dead tree. I was walking by the dead tree and I heard knocking, like someone knocking on the door. And I figured there was a woodpecker inside the hole making a hole or making a nest. Uh, so I set up my camera on the tripod and waited. And every once in a while, he'd stick his head out and spit out a mouthful of chips as he was digging deeper and deeper. This one on the right is a hairy woodpecker. Um, looks exactly like the downy woodpecker, but he's bigger and his beak is longer. His beak is as long as his head is wide, whereas the downy woodpecker is much smaller. Here's the true red-headed woodpecker. The entire head is red and the body is dark black and white. These guys need a lot of dead trees for their nest cavities and for uh, insects uh, that they eat. And we don't have enough dead trees, I think, for them to stay around. We see them for a few days in the spring and then they move on to other habitats. I wish they would stay, but that's why I leave dead trees up. So turkeys, wild turkeys are common in Wisconsin and up by Woodstock. Uh, we've seen them in the Barrington area a few times and we've seen them in the yard a couple of times. One year I did a little prescribed bird um, burn in our woods uh, to beat back the weedy plants. And the turkey came by and he was, you can see the shells of the sunflower seeds, he was scrounging under the bird feeder. And then a few weeks later, when the plants had grown up a bit, he came back. This time he was fluttering up in the air with great regularity and I couldn't figure out what he was doing until I realized there was a gray squirrel that was also scrounging under the bird feeder and he didn't like the turkey there. He was trying to chase the way. And the turkey would flutter up and react, but it wouldn't leave and it was bigger than the squirrel. We used to have a nest box um, for wood ducks and we would get screech owls in the nest box. And during the day, the little screech owl would sit in the hole and sun himself. There's a red phase and a gray phase, but it's all the same screech owl. And they're just adorable. Oops, I went too far. Oh. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Ah. Sorry, I got my buttons confused. Got a preview. So anyhow, the tree with the screech owl box um, fell over. So we put up a different screech owl box and had a few screech owls in it. The problem is keeping the squirrels out. And um, unfortunately a branch fell and knocked this one out. So I'm kind of between screech owl boxes right now. But the wood ducks come too. Oh, I got trail cams of the screech owl. Here he landed and caught an insect and wolfed it down. And here he landed, he already caught something, I couldn't tell what, and I slowed down the video so you can see him fly away. But adorable little owls. We do get wood ducks come by every spring and they come in the trees and they check out the nest holes. They are cavity nesters. They like to nest in holes that are 15 to 30 feet above the ground. They're spectacular, one of the prettiest ducks we have. And it's really strange to see a duck sitting in a tree 20 feet off the ground. The male is brightly colored and the female not. We get Cooper's hawks. Um, they live in the woods behind the house. They'll hunt birds uh, and they'll hunt birds off the bird feeder. And they'll also catch the occasional chipmunk like this one did. We find their nest in the woods every once in a while. Here's a female on the nest and a little white fluffy chick. Here's a different nest with a female yelling at me because she didn't like me so close. And here you can see the chicks are a little bigger and they're starting to leave the nest and exercise their wings. And that year those fledglings came to our pool and they used the first step on the steps as their giant bird bath. Three of them would come to the um, edge of the pool every afternoon around four o'clock and they take turns jumping in on the first step and fluttering around like any bird in a bird bath. It was pretty cute to watch. Finally, the red-tailed hawks are our biggest hawks. Um, they have a whitish belly with a dark, irregular belly band. Uh, here it's, it's more dramatic, here it's a little fainter, but usually they have this dark belly band and that's how you tell. Of course, the adults have a reddish tail. In the juveniles, it's a dark tail with um, a little streaking. And the juveniles have yellow eyes and the adults have dark eyes. Uh, but they'll land by our bird feeders and they're looking to hunt squirrels, but the squirrels are pretty wary and hard to catch. And so I'm gonna finish with um, 
one of the coolest observations I made, I was working on my computer and there was this huge fluttering of wings and I grabbed my camera and started shooting. And this red-tailed hawk was on the pole underneath the bird feeder. And when he came down, I could see he had a hole of the squirrel's tail. The squirrel had run up inside the uh, baffle and the hawk had got a hold of his tail and the pole at the same time. So he was not able to pull the squirrel out. And he hung there for a while holding on. He couldn't make any headway. He's looking around trying to decide what to do. This lasted almost two minutes. Finally, he loosened his grip and the squirrel shot up inside the baffle. The hawk let go. And down here, you can see a tuft of the squirrel hair that came out and he flew away and the squirrel lived to fight another day. So in summary, if you wanna see more wildlife, provide shelter, uh, provide native plants, provide brush and log piles, consider leaving dead trees up if it's safe and make a conscious uh, decision to let wildlife live under your deck. Um, they really don't cause much of a fuss as long as you control your pets when they're outside. Provide food in the form of native plants, which attract native insects. Um, and again, every species of bird, almost every species, eats ins wild insects at some point of their life. Provide water in the form of bird baths and ponds and control your pets outside. And please appreciate all the wildlife. Appreciate the weasels and the skunks and the possums. Appreciate the spiders and the snakes. And be looking all the time. Be looking out the window. Uh, face your chair so they face out the window. And think about a trail cam because they're, they're a lot of fun. So thanks for your attention. I know that was long. I hope all those um, animals entertained you. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate it. Um, so let's see. Um, oh, actually, Carol, if you want to tell us a little bit about um, our upcoming program, that would be great. I got to un unmute myself. Um, uh, we're going to be going into a quarterly webinar uh, schedule uh, rather than a monthly schedule. So our next program is going to be in February. The speaker is going to be Jim Vanderpoel. Uh, the Vanderpoels have had a long and important association with Citizens for Conservation. And um, uh, I, I have had sort of a fascination recently with the parsley or carrot family, which has some interesting combination of species in the family. And so Jim is going to talk about the parsley family. And that's going to be February 24th, I believe, is the date. So make a, make a plan to join us in February and uh, uh, we'll be passing uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's in the meantime. And uh, we'll come back in February for, for more of our, our webinar, webinar offerings.